Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <clears throat> How's it going, everybody? Alhamdulillah. That's how it's going? Alhamdulillah? How's it going? Alhamdulillah? Everybody's loud. Say alhamdulillah. All right, it's still kind of, uh, that's not how we do it in the south. We yell. All right, so one more time really loudly. Alhamdulillah. That's what I'm talking about. Gave me the last session. Shame on YM, all right? Last year I came here, they had me talk about hellfire for like 45 minutes. This year I come here, they give me the last session, so everybody wants to go to sleep and wants to eat food and all types of stuff. But um, yeah, and the reading of the bio thing, I, I enjoy coming to conferences, mashallah, it's a great experience. I love meeting the brothers and sisters, but this reading of the bio stuff has to stop, all right? Just, it's too much, you just sit there and listen to somebody reading something about yourself. It's too awkward, okay? All right. Tayyib. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Inshallah, we're going to be talking about the fourth khalifa, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. Ali, the son of Abu Talib radiallahu anhu. Ali radiallahu anhu, a brief introduction to him that he was, of course, for, of the Quraysh. He was the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was a younger brother of Aqil and Talib and Ja'far. And so he was a direct relative of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and a family member of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His father was the man who raised the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Talib just wasn't the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This was the man who raised him. This is the man who raised him. And so the Prophet ﷺ always felt a very special connection to Ali. Ali radiallahu anhu was kind of like a nephew to him. He was kind of like a nephew to him. That's what the relationship was somewhat like. And so he would often stay with the Prophet ﷺ. He would live with the Prophet ﷺ. Because of his father being very old, his parents being a lot older, he would stay with the Prophet ﷺ for extended periods of time. But I didn't want to take the very biographical route in talking about Ali radiallahu anhu because there's an entire lifetime to talk about. I wanted to more so f focus on what were the features of Ali radiallahu anhu and his life and his contributions. Ali radiallahu anhu is a very unique combination. He is a very unique personality from the history of Islam and he's a very unique combination of many, many different amazing features and aspects. The very first thing is that Ali radiallahu anhu, and this fits in with the theme of this part, these sessions that are going on, Ali radiallahu anhu was from the youth. He was a young man. He was basically even a kid. When the message arrived to the Prophet sallallahu Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, Ali radiallahu anhu in the most authentic of narrations was seven years old at the time. He was seven years old. And he was either the second or third person to accept Islam the second or the third person to accept Islam. And there's even a narration that says that the day the revelation arrived to the Prophet ﷺ, Ali radiallahu anhu accepted Islam the next day. The very next day he accepted Islam. So he was very, very young and he was only 30 years old when the Prophet ﷺ passed away. He was only 30 years old. Alright? To give you perspective, I'm 32. He was younger than I am. When the Prophet ﷺ passed away, think about that. He spent 23 years as a Muslim in the close company of the Prophet ﷺ by the age of 30. Unbelievable. And that's why when I, when I think of one word to describe Ali radiallahu anhu, he's what we call in our culture a prodigy. You know when you have a prodigy? Like a child that is extremely gifted at something. Ali radiallahu anhu was a prodigy. Ali radiallahu anhu was very, very devout. One key feature of his personality was he was very devout, very ascetic, meaning he had, he had, a, he had very little attachment to any material things. He was not interested in material things. And that's why actually I read a very, very interesting article about Ali radiallahu anhu written by an academic um, from one of the universities overseas. And he actually says that the gauge of success the way that we gauge success is that success leads to greatness. Success breeds more success. And the, the, the definition or the identifying 
feature of a failure is that he fails. The problem with that is, though, is that we often, we often describe or we often identify success in materialistic things. And if you were to take that look at Ali radiallahu anhu, you would end up defining him as a failure because you were looking at it from a materialistic standpoint. But we know he was successful. But it was a key feature of his personality that he had very little to no attachment to materialistic things. He just didn't really have the motivation to invest a lot of hard time and effort and money into temporary things. He had much bigger things on his plate. He had more important things that concerned him. So much so that when the Prophet ﷺ, and I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later, when he was finally going to get married, and there was the, per the Prophet ﷺ was personally involved in this, not only as the mentor of Ali radiallahu anhu, not only as the, the person who was a major influence in raising him, but also as his future father-in-law, the Prophet ﷺ actually had to tell Ali, all right, what do you have in terms of some material things? And he said, well, I have a couple of camels. He goes, okay, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna go out into the woods, you're gonna cut up some wood, you're gonna tie it up to your camels, you're gonna bring it back into town, you're gonna start selling it. Because you're gonna have to do that if you're going to support a family. He had to be given that level of instruction because he was so invested into the big picture. So that was a key aspect of his personality, but here's the catch. Here's the catch. What I'm describing might just sound like a loser to someone. But the thing was that he was so invested into his relationship with Allah and his commitment to the Rasul alayhi salam that he was so beloved to Allah and his Rasul that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallama looked at Ali radiallahu anhu, pointed at, him, pointed at him and said, لا يحبك إلا مؤمنون لا يحبك إلا مؤمنون ولا يبغذك إلا منافقون That the man who will love you, no one will love you except for a true believer. Meaning, a mu'min, a believer is the one that will love you. Because you embody iman. And the only one that will ever hate you will be a hypocrite. Because that person cannot appreciate your iman, your relationship with Allah. That's who Ali radiallahu anhu was. The Prophet ﷺ loved him so dearly, aside from the major things that we're going to talk about, just a small little incident about the love that the Prophet ﷺ had for this young man. There's a story that I'll talk about a little bit later. I'll go ahead and just mention it here. The level of trust the Prophet ﷺ had in Ali radiallahu anhu was, and the, the level of confidence he had in him, was that when the Prophet ﷺ had to migrate to Medina, he had to leave Mecca to go to Medina. He needed somebody to lie in his bed, to just be in the house, so that people looking from the outside would think that the Prophet ﷺ is still there, or even if they could identify Ali radiallahu anhu, Ali radiallahu anhu used to be with the Prophet ﷺ so often, that they would assume that if Ali's around, then the Prophet ﷺ must still be around. Because they remember they surrounded the house, they were plotting and planning to kill him, assassinate him. So he told Ali, lay in my bed. And they'll think that I'm still around. And Ali radiallahu anhu had that level of commitment to the Prophet ﷺ, where he put his own life in danger and laid down and pretended to be the Prophet ﷺ. And then he gave him a responsibility. He said in the morning when they realized that you're not me, or that you're still here but I'm gone, they're, what, at that time, you still can't leave and come to Medina. I need you to stay for at least a few days and I need you to give back to people the, the trust, the amana, the safe belongings that they, they entrusted to me. I want you to return it back to them. I want you to clear all my accounts. I want you to wrap up, tie up all the loose ends for me. That level of confidence and trust in him. So Ali radiallahu anhu spent three days running around frantically, giving people back their things, tying up all the loose ends, closing the accounts, taking care of everything. Then he left on foot to come to Medina. Because remember, he didn't have much. So he left on foot to come to Medina. When he reached Medina, by the time he reached Medina, his feet had become blistered and full of pus and had gotten so messed up that he literally couldn't even walk. His feet became swollen and infected and they were bleeding and there was pus. Horrible, horrible shape. And the Prophet ﷺ heard that Ali's gotten to Medina but he hasn't come and just met me yet. He hasn't checked in. So he said, go call Ali. Why won't he come and meet me? And they said, oh Messenger of Allah, Ali's messed up. He got hurt real bad. His feet are completely tore up. So the Prophet ﷺ goes to Ali radiallahu anhu. And he looks at him 
sitting there with his feet swollen and bleeding and pus. And the Prophet ﷺ gets tears in his eyes. And he walks up to him and he hugs him. Consoles him, says, don't worry, it'll be okay. And then the Prophet ﷺ, tafala fi, fi yadehi. He kind of lightly spit into his hands, like he applied some of his saliva in his hands. And he rubbed his hands like this, made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then massaged the feet of Ali radiallahu anhu. And Ali radiallahu anhu became cured. This is a miracle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Ali radiallahu anhu says that for the rest of my life, for the rest of my life, my feet never even hurt ever again. My, I never even felt sore. My feet would never even get sore ever again after that day, no matter what I would do. That's how much love the Prophet ﷺ had for him. Another story. When he reached Medina and this whole situation with his feet was taken care of, one of the, key, one of the first things that the Prophet ﷺ did when he came to Medina to establish brotherhood between the Muhajirun, the people who had migrated from Mecca to Medina, the outsiders, and the Ansar, the locals of Medina, one of the things the Prophet ﷺ did to incorporate brotherhood was he made one outsider one immigrant, the brother of a local Muslim. He took a local Muslim and made him the official brother of, a, of an outsider, of an immigrant Muslim. And he joined these, he formed these brotherhoods and sisterhoods. Ali radiallahu anhu was recovering for a couple of days and getting better when that whole situation was going on. And plus he arrived three days afterwards. So by the time he got there and he was up on his feet, it was already done. So he comes to the Prophet ﷺ very distraught. He says, O Messenger of Allah, it's a young man. He says, O Messenger of Allah, he's 20 years old. He says, you gave everybody a brother. But I didn't get a brother. The Prophet ﷺ said, he said, that's because you are my official brother. You are my official brother. أَخَاهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ بِنَفْسِهِ The Prophet ﷺ made him his own official brother. That's who Ali radiallahu anhu was, and that's what he meant to Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let the adhan finish, inshaAllah. And then the Prophet ﷺ told him after he gave him the good news that you're my official brother, he said, Anta akhi fi dunya wal akhira. You will be my brother not only in this world but also in the life of the hereafter. You're my brother. Ali radiallahu anhu. So after being devout and so connected to Allah and His Messenger, ﷺ, another key feature of his personality was that he was very brave and courageous. He was brave and courageous. He embodied what a young man should be. You know, uh, Dr. Abu Zaid was talking about that the strong believer. So he was brave and courageous. He was 27 years old at the time of the Battle of Khaybar. And that battle was single-handedly won on the back of Ali radiallahu anhu. Single-handedly won on his back. He participated with the Prophet ﷺ in every single campaign, every single battle, every single journey. One time, the Battle of Tabuk, when the Prophet ﷺ was going and he said, Ali, you're staying in Medina, he started to cry. He said, why won't you take me, O Messenger of Allah? You leave me behind with the women and children? And the Prophet ﷺ said, no, I need somebody here that I can trust. I need somebody here that I can trust. So he was very brave and courageous. Sa'ad bin Ubada radiallahu anhu was the caretaker of the flag of the Prophet ﷺ. So when the Prophet ﷺ would march or when they would go out for a battle or a campaign, they would have a flag. So the flag of the Prophet ﷺ, the caretaker, the person who would take care of it, was Sa'ad bin Ubada radiallahu anhu. But he says, but when it came time for battle, even I knew that it was time to hand that flag over to Ali radiallahu anhu. That's who he was. He was the man. 
Ali radiallahu anhu was extremely knowledgeable. Now look at these things, this unique combination. So we have devout, we have brave and courageous, and we even have knowledgeable. He says, Ali radiallahu anhu, Ata bin Abi Rabah, a, a major student of the Sahaba, a tabi'i, he was asked, was there anyone more knowledgeable among the companions of the Prophet ﷺ than Ali? And he says, nope, not that I know of. Not that I know of. There was no one more knowledgeable. Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas, everyone understands who Ibn Abbas is. This is one of the greatest scholars to ever walk the face of this earth the leader of the interpreters of the Qur'an. He says that if knowledge of the Sahaba, knowledge of the companions was split into 10 parts, Ali himself individually would have nine of those parts and one tenth of it was shared amongst the rest of the Sahaba. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu says, إِذَا ثَبَتَ لَنَا شَيْءٌ عَنْ Ali, لَمْ نَعْدِلْ إِلَىٰ غَيْرِهِ If something was established that Ali said something, or Ali told us something, we would have no need to go check with somebody else. That was done, it was a fact. So that's how knowledgeable he was. Aside from being knowledgeable and courageous and devout and regularly worshipping, Ali radiallahu anhu was also a leader. He also possessed leadership qualities. The pro he was sent to be a governor in the area of Yemen. He was appointed to be a governor of the, over the people of Yemen by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He asked the Prophet O oh Messenger of Allah, you're sending me to Yemen. They will ask me for judgments. They're gonna ask me to make decisions, give rulings, court, give decisions. And he said, and I don't have enough knowledge. I don't feel qualified to be making those calls. What should I do? The Prophet struck his chest. He struck his chest and he said, Allahumma thabbit lisanahu, wahdi qalbahu. He said, oh Allah, give him firmness in his tongue, in his speech. Give him confidence in his speech and guide his heart. Ali radiallahu anhu says, since that day I never had trouble ever in making decisions and I never second guessed or doubted myself after that day. Very knowledgeable, a strong, confident leader of his people. And not only that, but he was a father as well. He was a father. Uh, Shaykh Umar was talking about his sons, Al Hussein, uh, Al Hassan, Al Hussein, his sons, and the, the amazing people that they were. Well, those sons are a reflection of their father. He was a, an unbelievable father. I have a very short little passage here that is the advice of Ali radiallahu anhu that he gave to his son, Hassan. Awsa Aliyun waladahu al Hassan wa Ya Bunaya Usika Allah. He said, My dear son, my dear son, I strongly advise that you firmly hold on to the taqwa of Allah, the cognizance, the awareness of Allah. And you hold on to the truth, the, speaking the truth, even in good times or in bad times. Ya Bunaya, man hafara li akhihi bi'ran waqa'afiha. He said, my dear son, whoever digs a well for his brother, he himself will fall into that well. Whoever behaves treacherously with his brother only harms himself. Whosoever becomes too overconfident, whosoever becomes too impressed with him, him or herself, that person has gone astray, that person has lost their way. Whosoever becomes confident and independent based on his own intelligence, again, becomes overconfident based on his or her own intelligence, Zalla, that person slipped. That person's gone. Whosoever keeps company with lowly people, people of not good character, that person has disgraced and humiliated himself. And whosoever sits with the knowledgeable people, that person has honored and dignified himself. He says, contentment, satisfaction, being happy and pleased with what Allah has given you, this is a wealth that will never expire, it will never run out. That's money that never runs out. وَالْأَدَبُ خَيْرُ مِيرَاثٍ And the best thing that you can leave behind for the people that you leave behind is good manners and good etiquette. وَحُسْنُ الْخُلُقِ خَيْرُ قَرِينٍ And the best friend 
that you can ever have. The best homie you can ever roll with is having good khuluq, is having good conduct, good character, behaving di in a dignified manner, treating people respectfully, is the best companion that you can ever roll with. This is the advice that he's giving to his son. And guess what? After being a leader and an alim, a scholar, and being a brave warrior, and being a devout worshiper, and being someone close to Allah and His Messenger, and being such an amazing father, and this is what I want young people to pay attention to. He was also a husband. And I'm gonna use this word, but I want you to understand in its proper context, in its classical context. He wasn't just a husband, but he was a lover. He loved his wife. And he was a very loving, compassionate, romantic husband. And his wife was of course none other than the daughter of the Prophet and Fatima. Which literally when she was old enough to get married, there was a line of people lined up with proposals. Line of people with proposals. And the Prophet kept turning people away, kept turning people away. And finally he comes to his daughter and he says, I know the right man for you, the only right man for you, the only one that I think is good enough to marry you, and that is Ali. And how much did Ali love Fatima? How much in, how in love was he with Fatima? Something very, we were talking about some of the tragedies of these great individuals. When he was 30 years old, I told you, his mentor, the man who taught him so much, and his messenger and his prophet, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam passed away. Six months after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam passed away, Fatima, who was very close to her father, she couldn't live without her father. She lost the will to live without her father. And six months after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam passed away, his wife Fatima passed away. She died. 30 years old, he lost his wife. And what shows the amount of love that he had for her? There's some couplets, some poetry that after she was buried and he was still just in so much pain and agony from losing his wife, the love of his life. He went and stood on her grave and he recited some poetry, some couplets. He says, Mali waqaftu ala, ala al -quburi musallima. He says, What's wrong with me that I'm standing at a grave and saying salam? Qabr al Habibi falam yarudda jawabi. The grave of my beloved, and my beloved won't even return my salam. A habibu malakala tarudda jawabana. My beloved, what's wrong? Why won't you reply to me? Anasita ba'da khullatil ahbabi. Have you forgotten all the good times that we enjoyed? Have you forgotten all the intimate moments that we shared? Qal al habibu, and then he says, he himself responds what the beloved must be saying. He says, the beloved says, وَكَيْفَ لِي بِجَوَابِكُمْ How do you expect me to reply to you? وَأَنَا رَهِينُ جَنَادِلَ وَالتُرَابِ When I have become entrusted to rocks and dirt and dust. I've been turned into dust and rocks and stone. أَكَلَتْ تُرَابُ مَحَاسِنِي فَنَسِيتُكُمْ The dirt has eaten away at all of my beauty. And I have forgotten you. وَحَجِبْتُ عَنْ أَهْلِي وَعَنْ, أج... وعن أَحْبَابِي And my beloved people and my family have been covered from me. I can no longer see them. فَعَلَيْكُمْ مِنِّي السلام. Take salam from me. تَقَطَّعَتْ مِنِّي وَمِنْكُمْ خِلَّةَ الْأَحْبَابِ Those good, intimate, private moments, loving moments that we share together, they are gone. They're finished. Such a lover. Such a husband. And it shows again that very unique personality that he was. And I want the youth to hear this and understand that when we talk about living up to the character of these people, does that, that does not preclude the human experience. This is a loving, doting father. This is a romantic husband. But he's also embodying all those other amazing qualities. I'm going to end here by kind of wrapping up or concluding everything that's been talked about from Abu Bakr to Umar to Uthman to Ali. The Prophet وسلم, that these four are included in a narration which lists those ten people that were promised paradise by the Prophet. Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr fil Jannah, 
وعمر في الجنة وعثمان في الجنة وعلي في الجنة وطلحة بن عبيد الله في الجنة والزبير بن العوام في الجنة وسعد بن أبي وقاص في الجنة وعبد الرحمن بن عوف في الجنة وأبو عبيد عامر بن الجراح في الجنة وسعيد بن زيد بن عمر بن نفيل في الجنة the Prophet ﷺ is saying Abu Bakr is in paradise, Umar is in paradise, Uthman is in Jannah, Ali is in paradise. These were amazing, remarkable people. But here's what we need to understand, what I need to understand, what all of us need to understand. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he was like the older community leader. I'm talking about before Islam. He was the older uncle, like the community leader. Umar radiallahu anhu was the guy you didn't want to cross paths with. He was what we call a roughneck. He says himself, before Islam, he says, I used to drink and womanize. That's what I used to do. Uthman radiallahu anhu, as he described very eloquently, was a very wealthy individual and a very reserved person. A very reserved, quiet, but very wealthy individual. Ali radiallahu anhu, like I said, was that young boy who was the prodigy. You knew this kid had a bright future. You knew this kid could do whatever you wanted to. Do you see how they represent different demographics in our community? How they come from all spectrums of the community? But they were all able to achieve success. And so what I want everyone here to go away, what, what I want you to leave this session realizing and understanding. You represent a demographic, a, a certain aspect of the Muslim community. But each and every single one of you has that same amazing potential to be successful, to leave a legacy, to be a role model, to not just improve yourself, but impact others in a positive way. All of you have that ability. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to practice. Jazakumullah khairan. Subhanallah wa rahmatullah.